Our great God and Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for the Lord Jesus Christ, how thankful we are for uh, just uh, the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus, and we're thankful that we have the sure Word of God. We just ask that you would guide us and direct us now. As I close out this evening, we pray that this will be helpful and an encouragement to each and every one. In Jesus' name, we do pay, pray, amen. Uh, providential preservation is what I'm going to be talking about. And um, uh, in Psalm 11 and verse 3, it says, If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, Lynn and I had the blessed opportunity uh, for 12 years. We didn't get to travel much together because we cared for my elderly father. He went home to be with the Lord. And so we decided to combine some work with pleasure. Uh, Dr. Stringer and I had uh, the blessing of doing uh, King James meeting uh, in Wales, do some preaching in the UK. But uh, uh, I took my wife uh, ahead of time, and we went to the Louvre. Uh, that's a great museum in Paris. And uh, here's a three-legged stool. Uh, this is, uh, if you're into antiques, this is a 19th century Baroque-style three-legged stool. Now, let me just tell you something. You have to be able to have, in a table or a stool, you have to be able to have three legs to stand. You don't see tables that have two legs. Now, the Christi Christianity is much like a three-legged stool. Christianity clearly, and the right kind of Christianity, uh, the only kind of Christianity, this true Christianity, is based on the Bible. It has to be. Without the Bible, Christianity cannot stand. Uh, but there are three legs to uh, this stool that I want to talk to you about. There's inspiration of the Scriptures. There is the infallibility of the Scriptures. And there is the inerrancy of the scriptures as well. If you take away any one of those legs, then I want to tell you, surely uh, the table is going to topple. And if you take away any one of those aspects of Christianity, then you don't have biblical Christianity anymore and things are going to fall. I want to talk to you uh, now about uh, 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 the fact of, of what happens when you take away some of these things. Uh, we already looked at the divine authority, and we're going to look at belief in the three ends. The three ends that we just looked at, uh, they're foundational to have totally genuine Christianity. So let's begin by looking at uh, inspiration. Uh, inspiration is... Uh, relating to the origins of the Bible. Uh, God breathed it out, the very words, and holy men, by the moving of the Holy Spirit, recorded them without error. As has already been mentioned, God's word was given just once. We know this in Jude 1, 3, and you already know about 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, we know that uh, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't their private interpretation that they gave. Inspiration is the process whereby the Holy Spirit led the writers of Scripture to record without error his very words. And the product of that process is an inspired original. original. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at infallibility. Infallibility has to do with the authority and the enduring nature of the Bible. Infallibility carries the idea of being incapable of error. Uh, it is never wrong. It is unfailing. It is completely trustworthy. And as we read in Matthew, the scriptures are unable to be broken. Now, moving to the issue of inerrancy. Uh, inerrancy, the in is that the Bible is without error. It is free 
From error, it is free from untruth. Now, today, uh, the Christian faith is kind of like that old nursery rhyme. Uh, London Bridge is falling down. Uh, Christianity in so many sections and sectors and colleges and in seminary, uh, the, the Christianity is falling down because for the past century there has been little or no teaching on the doctrine and the biblical definition of inerrancy. Uh, I thought I got a good uh, Bible college education. I, mean, I really worked hard at it. I crammed four years into five years and uh, got my bachelor's degree. Then I spent two years getting my master of theology degree. And uh, I was taught over and over and over again in the college that I went to that the original writings were inspired and everybody could quote 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. However, I was not taught, I was not taught anything about inerrancy and when I was ordained, no one asked me a single question about inerrancy, and it's probably because they didn't know anything about it either. And, uh, uh, you know, we're in big trouble if we don't understand what biblical inerrancy is. Um, let's talk about uh, the uh, two pillars of inerrancy, and <clears throat> we already looked at one a little bit, divine inspiration. And that's uh, certainly uh, the first pillar. The original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts of the, of the Bible are given by inspiration of God. But providential preservation of the copies. Uh, and so uh, let's just move on. That's the first one. We looked at that. And the second one here. When I'm talking about divine preservation, divine preservation is the work of God whereby through sovereign providence using human instrument in instrumentality, he has kept the inspired inerrant words of the autographs intact down through the ages in the extant uh, traditional Hebrew and Greek manuscripts that we have. And uh, we have God's word today. And we've already seen this some. We have God's word in English in our King James Bible. Now, I just want you to know something. Historically, historically, Baptists believed in divine preservation of the scriptures. Uh, you know, when uh, we get down uh, to it, if we go back to the London Baptist Confession, that would be 1689. And there you have the words of it, the Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at the time of the writings of it was the most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God, now watch this, and by His singular care and providence kept pure in all ages are therefore authentical. That means to be identical with the originals. Um, I want to tell you something. In the Philadelphia Confession of Faith in 1742, it adopted the London Baptist Confession of Faith and embraced divine inspiration and divine preservation and most all Baptist doctrinal statements had this or a version of this until 1845. Uh, here's a big problem. Today, the day that we're living in, Bible-believing Christians are likely to agree with the first pillar of iner in um, inerrancy, that is divine inspiration of the originals. Uh, I was taught that in Bible college and seminary, as I said, but I want you to know that divine preservation, by and large, has vanished. It's not taught in Bible college. It's not taught in most seminaries. The doctrine of divine preservation has virtually disappeared. It's not preached in the pulpits. It's not taught in the Bible colleges. It's not taught in the seminaries. Now, I know that there are some section, um, places that do that, but it's virtually gone and we'll see some reasons why for that. But here's what that means. Uh, here's what that means. 
if you only preach divine inspiration without divine preservation, you have a half-truth. Without the doctrine of divine preservation, we are left with a meaningless definition of inerrancy. Uh, if you don't think so, enters 1978. Some of you guys know about this and the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy, where a whole bunch of the evangelicals got together and they say, God has nowhere promised an inerrant transmission of the scriptures, simply no translation of, of the Bible is or can be perfect. And you know you have so many pastors, even fundamental Baptist pastors, who are on this bandwagon today. Uh, Dr. Douglas Stoffer writes in his book, A One Book, One Authority, and here's what he says. He says, over the past five decades, the typical seminary has failed to teach that the scriptures are the words of God and that we can hold them in our hands. Uh, the issue has transitioned from Paul's repeated inquiry, what saith the scriptures, now listen to this, to where is the scriptures? I was sitting in on a debate from uh, Bible colleges around the nation, and uh, they were cutting us down. They all, they, the people like me who uh, believed in uh, providential preservation and uh, believed that God's given us the King James Version of the Bible uh, preserved in the English language, they called us Ruckmanites, and, and I walked out, and one of the men there, I said, well, they didn't know I was there in the back room. I happened to have a radio program on that station at the time. I said, exactly where are the words of God then? And that's the question, where are the words of God? And he put his hand, he said, someplace in here. And he had a stack of about 27 different versions or so. Uh, but he wasn't sure where they were. It can be certain that the Apostle Paul in the first century uh, was not referring to the original Hebrew manuscripts, but the copies of the copies of the copies, uh, even at his time. Uh, I want to tell you what that does to biblical Christianity. It takes, a th it takes away the authority of the Scripture. Is it any wonder that our churches are powerless? They don't have a definitive word of God. Our families are falling apart. Our culture is reprobate when those who call themselves preachers, even fundamental Baptists, don't believe that God has preserved his words today. And if he does believe it, he has no idea where those words are. <laughs> if God has not preserved his words for us today, there is no divine authority. Even liberals recognize the foolishness of believing in inspiration without believing in preservation. Uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Mr. Roger Olson. He's a liberal professor of theology at Baylor University uh, at the George W. Truett Theological Seminary, and he wrote an article in 2006 in the Baptist Standard, Why Inerrancy Doesn't Matter. And here's what he said. He says, think about it. If the Bible's authority depends on its inerrancy, and I'd like to stop there, and it does, but only the original manuscripts are inerrant, then only the original manuscripts were authoritative. The logic is impeccable and irreversible. And if inerrancy is compatible with flawed approximations, faulty chronologies, and the use of incorrect sources by biblical authors, it is a meaningless concept. Uh, very interestingly, he goes on to say this, even its most ardent and staunch proponents admit no existing Bible is inerrant. Obviously, they didn't consult me. Um, they attribute inerrancy only to the originals, which do not exist. They kill the ordinary meaning of the word with the death of a thousand qualifications. 
If you doubt that, please read, and we just read it, the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy, which is usually considered the standard evangelical account of the concept. I just want to tell you the divine authority of the Christian faith will disappear and by and large has disappeared if we, you and I, preachers, do not once again teach the next generation the truth that God has preserved his words. In the Hebrew Aramaic Masoretic text, the Greek traditional text, and by accurate translation, we have God's word in our King James Bible. We must get back to teaching that again. You know, um, the Bible derives its authority from its authenticity. Its authenticity is derived from its authorship being 100% pure in its originals as received by divine inspiration and 100% pure in the copies of the Hebrew Aramaic Masoretic text and the Greek traditional text and 100% preserved by accurate translation in our King James Version of the Bible, we must connect the chain. We must pick up the torch and go forward in it. The King James Bible is God's word kept intact in English. It maintains all the authority and all the power that God placed on and in his words in the originals. Only then can the integrity and the authority of the scripture be reestablished. You know, um, the fact of the matter is, is either the word of God exists intact and in total, or they exist incompletely and in part, and no one can know for sure what they are. It can't be both. It has to be one or the other. Now, I'd like to trace just for a little bit uh, what caused the demise of providential preservation. It's really not too hard to trace this. It really isn't that bad or that hard to trace this at all. Um, and my purpose is not to, uh, I don't have the time to develop it in depth, but just give you a skeletal framework which led to the extinction. And I'm uh, going to, to start with uh, Charles Hodge. Uh, Charles Hodge, the second president of Princeton Theological Sem Seminary, which was a stronghold of Pro Protestant orthodoxy, uh, he entered the slippery slope uh, which began the fatal slide of uh, rejection of providential pre preservation by moving towards enlightenment, uh, uh, enlightenment philosophy and scientific uh, apologetics, where the human mind and human reason were the authority and were reliable in defining biblical truths. Uh, that included the Bible. Uh, it all began there, and uh, what a great tragedy it was. Then um, the next thing that added to the demise was Charles Darwin. Uh, in 1859, Charles Darwin published his, and the pro proper title is On the Origin of Species, and I tell you what, atheists and unbelievers jumped on Darwin's theory uh, it's real interesting to, to see how they, they jumped on that. Uh, Chet Ramos sums it up pretty well uh, in uh, Skeptics and True Believers when he wrote this. If the Bible was wrong in the very first chapter of Genesis, then the veracity of the entire enterprise was called into question. Evolution was not just a scientific idea, it was a bombshell that was welcomed by atheists and feared by theists. And you know what happened? Let me just tell you what happened. You know, the preachers didn't want to seem like they were dumb. 
uh, you know, they didn't want to seem uneducated. They didn't want to seem out of touch. So what they tried to do was syncretize biblical truth with Darwinian evolution. And when they tried to syncretize biblical truth with Darwinian evolution, um, you end up with a big problem because uh, the philosophy that Darwinism promotes is that there's really no purpose in life and man is just a high-functioning animal. There's no need of salvation. And uh, so then you get this theistic evolution that comes into play, you know, and they, they start messing around with the scriptures and redefining terms. God is left out because he is not relevant. Well, then uh, enters these two guys. Um, I'm sure that you uh, recognize Hort on the left and, and Westcott on the right. But uh, Darwinism had set the stage at this point. A direct attack on inerrancy of the Bible came with uh, Brooke Foss, Westcott, and Fenton John, <clears throat> Fenton John Anthony Hort. And here's what happened. This is, this is what they did. Westcott and Hort, um, they changed the Greek text of the New Testament to one of their own private interpretation. A lot of people don't realize this, but they used a lot of Griesbach, um, uh, Greek New Testament. Griesbach was a, was a Unitarian and... Uh, uh, in so doing, they rejected the New Testament traditional text of the Greek that had been handed down from the times of the apostles that's referred to, as we know it, the Textus Receptus. And when we talk about the Textus Receptus, that's Latin. It means the text received uh, by the group or by the saints. Uh, in changing the text of the canon, they forsook the 100% pure word of God. But equally important... Here it is. They forsook the biblical and historical doctrine of divine preservation held by the early saints, held by the reformers, and by our Baptist ancestors. As clearly, as clearly the revealed word of God, they dumped all that out. All English translations since Westcott and Hort have been based upon the version of the corrupt text Amended and amended and amended. What is it, 27 now? 28 times it's been amended in the Nesselalons? I don't know. 28. Next we come to this man. And uh, here we have A. A. Hodge, Archibald Alexander Hodge. And um, Archibald Alexander Hodge, he was the son of Charles Hodge, um, and uh, uh, he favored higher criticism, textual criticism. He argued, listen to this now, see the transition. He was arguing that providential preservation statement that was in um, the early documents uh, that said kept here in all ages meant, listen to this, a state of essential purity. Now there's a big difference. It's, it's not up on here. Uh, the essential integrity of the text needed to be established. That's what he said. H how did he mean that? Well, he meant that by means of careful collation of using the principles of Westcott and Hort, you compared the text with the ancient manuscripts, and if they agreed, then that's what you used, and that's what part of the scripture was preserved. Uh, he was shameless, and he said this, the original autographs weren't inerrant. In fact, he said, quote, it is even possible that some of the autographs, if we had them, might not be altogether free from error. So he's going back to say even the original ones might not be free from error. Uh, as uh, arise from a slip of the pen, as the apostle had amanuensis uh, who were not inspired. Uh, very interesting. And then enters Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, B.B. Warfield. He's the fourth president of, of Princeton. And uh, uh, he wholly embraced higher criticism. 
and uh, uh, the text of Westcott and Hort. Uh, Dr. Warfield ignored providential preservation of the scripture and treated the New Testament text as he would any other writing. Uh, Warfield uh, wholly adopted the text techniques of textual criticism and employed by Westcott and Hort, and Warfield embraced the ability of the apostate editors of the New Testament text to restore the words of God. You know what he believed? They'd lost the words of God. Nobody knows where the words of God are. And then to, so we've got to restore the words of God. I, kn I know where the words of God are, friends. See, here's the problem. Uh, today, most leading fundamental leaders, colleges and seminaries, deny the historic and biblical views of providential preservation of the scriptures. I was reading some of them this week, and uh, it is so interesting the way that they dance around these things. They're, they're really doing the dance on providential preservation. And basically, uh, what we have is four views of providential preservation. The first view of providential preservation uh, is uh, no preservation. Uh, this view holds that the inspiration of the scripture is enough. Remember only the half truth. And there is no need for a belief in preservation. Uh, Cornelius Van Til uh, a Reformed theologian wrote in his book, The Doctrine of Scripture, he says, uh, the important point is not whether or not we possess the autographa, but whether they have actually existed. Without them, there is no Christ who has spoken in history. With them, we have such a Christ with them, we have many problems of the text and translation, but no ultimate meaningless mystery uh, such as we would have without them. Van Til obviously believed in uh, the infallibility of the originals, uh, but uh, uh, he denied the preservation and the infallibility of the copies or of the autographs uh, and the infallibility, infallibility of, the, of the translations. Uh, several years back, uh, Dr. Stringer and I sat uh, in a restaurant uh, with this man. Uh, some of you might recognize him. Uh, his name is, is Dan Wallace. He's a professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary, and we discussed some of the Byzantine manuscripts that had been uncovered and a couple of friends of mine right now are over there examining a number of those manuscripts and photographing them. They should be back by now or back very soon. Uh, but uh, the Byzantine manuscripts uh, support uh, our text line, the preserved text line, and I couldn't figure out why that um, he really would be interested in them at all because, in fact, he and W. Edward Glenny, uh, who uh, is a professor of New Testament studies at uh, Northwestern University in St. Paul, uh, they have eliminated any vestige of preservation of the scriptures as doctrine. And in an article by Wallace, Inspiration, Preservation, and New Testament Criticism, you will find the clear, definitive, systematic denial of the doctrine of the preservation of the scripture. His interest in those manuscripts were purely academic. You know, I pose a question. What good is an inspired text that may once have existed if it doesn't exist today? How can we ever be sure it did exist if there's not providential preservation? Um, that's very interesting um, uh, because uh, enters critic Bart Ehrman and uh, Bart Ehrman, who I understand now um, claims to be an agnostic, but Ehrman wrote this. If one wants to insist that God inspired the very words of Scripture, uh, what would be the point, he's asking this, 
What would be the point if we don't have the very words of Scripture? What's the point? It's a bit hard to know what the words of the Bible mean if we don't even know what the words are. Yep. Here's another quote from his book, uh, Misquoting Jesus. He says this, The only reason I came to think for God to inspire the Bible would be so that his people would have his actual words. But if he really wanted people to have his actual words, surely he would have miraculously preserved those words just as he miraculously inspired them in the first place. Now watch this, watch this. Given the circumstance that he didn't preserve the words, the conclusion seems inescapable to me that he hadn't gone to the trouble of inspiring them. He's one of the ones. No preservation. Now, there's a second view, and that's partial preservation. There's many fundamentalists who are, are in this, this camp. Uh, and um, uh, these advocates say, well, he probably preserved 93%, 98%. But they're kind of making themselves God because they can't really know which ones are inspired and which ones are aren't. So, you know, the remaining 7% to 1.3% uh, may not have been preserved. They assert that the Word of God exists uh, where all the manuscripts agree. I want to tell you something. I have an exact facsimile copy of Sinaiticus, and I have an exact facsimile copy available to me of Vaticanus. And it's been a real struggle, but you know what? Uh, reading and reading and comparing things, uh, it's easier to find uh, two verses that don't agree in those two manuscripts and between those two manuscripts than two verses that do agree. They differ in just the Gospels alone. In over 3,000 places they differ. That's really, really bizarre. Um, where the manuscripts disagree... Textual criticism is less left to determine what is the best reading, and if it cannot be done with accuracy, and that rarely happens, it must be admitted that the believer cannot be sure what the truth really is. Do you realize that's what's happening to the younger generation where they have all these different Bibles and nobody knows. Uh, and I was teaching at one place by invitation and there was at least four different Bible versions and one girl said, my Bible says this and the other girl says, my Bible doesn't say that at all. My Bible says this and the other girl says, that's not even in my Bible. Um... Wow. Uh, some of you uh, might know who Dr. Stuart Custer is. He holds to the partial preservation view. Uh, and uh, in his book, Witness to Christ, a commentary on Acts, Dr. Custer makes a profound confession when he comments on Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, which reads in our King James Version of the Bible, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church. You see that highlighted there? To the church daily, such as should be saved. He says this. The King James follows the Western text, B's and D, uh, in adding to the church. The idea is certainly implied in the text, and the Western text regularly supplies this explanation and then he says this, for the rest of the older manuscripts. You know what that means? Uh, that means Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. But let me just tell you something. Do you realize that Vaticanus, nobody really knows what is actually said in Vaticanus originally because it was completely overwritten in the 15th century? Do you realize that? 
And uh, you can turn to what would be Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, in the middle of the column there. I was so excited when I found this. Uh, there's a scribe that says, fool and knave, leave the old reading. Somebody's doctored the text. And I, I, I just want to tell you this. I think that, and I have it out there, I, I think that Sinaiticus is the work of Constantine Simonides in the 1800s. There was a whole battle over that in the newspaper. So these two supposedly oldest and best manuscripts, one of them you don't know for sure what it really said, and the other one is probably a forgery. He goes on to say, uh, as he talks about the 4th century manuscripts, the first occurrence of the word church is in Acts chapter 5 and verse 11. And I should put this up for you to see. It says, all such variations in manuscripts evidence should be treated with respect. And then he says this, only God knows infallibly which variation was original. Since only God knows the true reading, uh, can uh, Custer believe in uh, partial preservation? Charles Ryrie would fit into the category of those who believe in partial preservation because in the Ryrie Study Bible, commenting on 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, he says, the original numbers in this verse have apparently been lost in transmission. While I do not, uh, and, and so... I'm not saying that I understand exactly what's going there, but I'm not willing to cast doubt on my King James Version of the Bible just because I don't understand it. And then there is this one that's a very popular one, the heavenly preservation view. Now, those who advocate the heavenly uh, preservation view say that it's preserved only in heaven. I believe that it's preserved in heaven, but not only in heaven. Uh, Psalm 11989 uh, 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 very clearly uh, says that God's word is preserved in heaven forever, O Lord, thy word is preserved in heaven. Uh, I was uh, at a conference and right in front of me uh, sat, do sat, sat Dr. Larry Oates. And uh, it's, it's interesting, Dr. Oates of Maranatha Baptist University holds the view of uh, uh, heavenly preservation, I believe. Um, and um, he stated in 1996 at Calvary Baptist Seminary in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, the preservation of the Word of God is perfectly accomplished by God in heaven. The preservation of God's Word on earth has been committed to people. God anticipated the possibility of failure on man's part in accur accurately preserving the autographs, and then he says this, God could have preserved his word, but history proves he did not. Um, here's what I believe. In a peculiar way, this aligns Dr. Oates alongside of this man, this is Professor David Parker of the University of Birmingham in the UK, and he wrote the living text of the gospel. And he said, the concept of the gospel that is fixed in shape, authoritative, and as a final piece of literature has been abandoned. The free text indicates that to at least some early Christians, it was more important to hand on the spirit of Jesus Christ's teachings than remembering the letter, than remember the letter. Uh, the material about Jesus was preserved in an interpretive rather than an exact fashion, in exact fashion. Or God is not concerned about words, but he's only concerned about context, uh, He's only concerned about context. Con I can't even say the word. Concepts. There we go. Uh, I certainly believe God's word is settled in heaven. Um, you will get no argument from me on that, uh, indeed. Uh, but I also believe what I read in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. 
But Jesus, uh, but he, Jesus answered and said, it is written. One of the other speakers said, in relationship to Deuteronomy, uh, it's a quote from Deuteronomy 8.3, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I contend that we have on earth, in our King James Bible, uh, a perfect reproduction of that which is settled in heaven. In John chapter 17, and uh, verse 8 says, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Jesus is saying the words that the Father gave him. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out of thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. The Lord's disciples gave, the Lord gave his disciples those words which were settled in heaven. Uh, these words are what the Holy Ghost brought to the minds of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who by inspiration wrote them down according to John 14, 26. One author put it this way, what is written on earth is what was taken from above and given to human authors by the Holy Ghost. Um, very simply, we have the words of God. Looking at providential preservation or verbal plenary preservation, um, verbal means every word to the jot and tittle. Plenary means the scripture as a whole with all the words is intact. So verbal plenary preservation means that the whole scripture with all of its words, even to the jots and tittles, is perfectly preserved by God without any loss of the original words, original prophecies, original promises, commandments, doctrines, truth, not only in the words of salvation, but also the words of history, geography, and science. Every book, every chapter, every verse, every word, every syllable, every letter is infallibly preserved by the Lord himself to the last iota. Edward F. Hills says this, if the doctrine of divine inspiration of the Old Testament scriptures is a true doctrine, the doctrine of providential preservation of the scriptures must also be a true doctrine. It must be that down through the centuries, God has exercised special providential control over the copying of the scriptures and the preservation and use of the copies so that trustworthy representatives of the original text have been available to God's people in every age. God must have done this, for if he gave the scriptures to his church by inspiration as the perfect and final revelation of his will, then it is obvious that he would not allow this revelation to disappear or undergo any alteration in its fundamental character. Hills goes on to say that all branches of the Christian church, either implicitly or explicitly, held a providential preservation, uh, and uh, that was the necessary consequence of divine ins inspiration. Where are the preserved words of Scripture today? Well, the infallible and errant words of Scripture are found in the faithfully preserved, as I've said so many times, Masoretic Hebrew texts, not Kittle's Biblical Hebraica, and the traditional Byzantine apostolic majority manuscripts uh, as represented in the printed and received text, the Textus Receptus, that underlines the Reformation Bibles, and not in the corrupt Alexandrian manuscripts, the critical text of Westcott and Hort, 
that underlie the liberal, ecumenical, neo-evangelical, modern versions such as the English Bible, the NIV, the NASB, the ESV, the RSV, the TEV, the CEV, and I could go on and on and on and on and on. There is clear biblical support for providential preservation. Uh, if you claim that uh, something is a doctrine, it must be taught in the Bible, and in fact, providential preservation is clearly taught in the Bible. And one of the best verses is Psalm 12, 6, and 7, and I know there's problems. I'm going to talk about that, and then we're going to wrap up. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now that is uh, what it very clearly says there. Uh, if you take this apart, you see that the extent of preservation is to the words. Uh, note the agent of preservation is thou, O Lord. And note that the period of preservation is forever. Now, Modern fundamentalists insist on rejecting this text as teaching verbal, uh, every word, preservation of the words of God. And why am I not surprised? <laughs> and so what happens is, is they've come up with a defense uh, to attack this particular passage of Scripture. According to the opponents now, the every word preservation, them must take a masculine plural antecedent, please bear with me, uh, since it has a masculine plural prenomal suffix itself. Further, they claim that the nearest word to qualify is poor and needy of verse 5, which are both masculine plural words. Uh, they theorize that the passage is not referring to God's word, but preserving the poor and needy. God will preserve the poor and needy. I have a question. If God cannot preserve his word... How is he expected to preserve his people? They really do not want to address uh, that theological problem. You see, here's the deal. Uh, I don't do Hebrew well, but I do have uh, and know a, a person who does Hebrew well. And let me just assure you, and I'll give some illustrations quickly, but Psalm 12 is an illustration of what is called gender discordance. Just hang on. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about gender discordance, this is a feminine word or words uh, being the apparent antecedent of a masculine plural or a masculine singer pronoun suffix like them. The second them has a masculine singular pronoun suffix. And you say, well, what does all that mean? Well, although uh, very clearly uh, word, the words closest, uh, words are the closest antecedent, not the poor and needy. Uh, this is called the rule of proximity. Uh, normally, this would mean that there's an obstacle or a problem, uh, and so uh, that's why they say, ah, there's a flaw with this idea of a verse supporting providential preservation. No, there's not. Uh, here's the reason why. Uh, the standard Gesanus um, Hebrew dictionary grammar says masculine suff suffices, especially in the plural, are not infrequently used to refer to feminine superlatives. All, it says also recent Hebrew grammar, uh, Watke and O'Connor, the masculine pronoun is often used with a feminine antecedent. Now, the reason I went through all of that 
was to do this. All of these illustrations, Psalm 119, 111, Psalm 119, 129, Psalm 119, 152, Psalm 119, 167, uh, they all have gender discordance and are just fine and nobody questions them. The gender discordance of Psalm 12, 6, and 7 does not negate what the verse is saying. The them, thou shalt keep them according to the rule of proximity, is the words of the Lord. It is the words of the Lord that are preserved, and God has preserved those words. Praise God for that. We have the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. Well, I've kept you long enough on this, and I'm going to skip the last two pages. But what I am very clearly urging you to do is to get back to teaching and preaching the providential preservation of the Word of God. You have to go back to laying the foundation and teaching inerrancy. When was the last time you preached on that? Some of you may have. But for the most part, uh, preachers are not doing that. And if we do not have the Word of God if it is not the authority, if we don't know where the words of God are, we are in big trouble. And I'll tell you what, it's only people that believe like us who are going to take the time to teach this and explode a bunch of the arguments that these fundamental Baptist preachers are putting forth like that Psalm 12, 6 and 7 does not support providential preservation. It does! And so we need to do the work, do the study, try not to make it boring, and really get across the point that God indeed has preserved his words. And in English, it is our King James Version of the Bible. It is all there. It has all the power. And you know what? If it says I'm a sinner... I'm a sinner. If it says do this, we need to do this. We don't say, well, we don't know whether that's in the original manuscripts or not. It's here. And praise God. Thank you so much.